morning. Good morning. Welcome to the Ventura Center for Spiritual Living. I'm Reverend Bonnie Rose. We're having a celebration of love this morning, love and kindness and all good things. Let's stand up and we'll sing together our opening song, which is Hands of Grace. We'll sing it together. We'll sing it like we mean it. Let, it, let us allow it to open our hearts. Here we go. And so we breathe deeply, breathing in and out, allowing ourselves to be still and know, allowing ourselves to be fully present here in this sacred space, just trusting and knowing that something wonderful has called us here this morning. Some call it God, some call it higher power, some call it love, some call it absolute reality. But together we know that we have been drawn here this morning by divine appointment to rest and resonate in the I am presence. The I am presence, which is all of those names of God that I mentioned, all of those names of love. And so let us start our service by remembering who we truly are, that we are one with the divine, that the divine is manifesting itself through us always as us. And as we sing this, and as we know this for ourselves, we also expand our consciousness to know it for other beings as well. To know that all beings everywhere, both animate and inanimate, with human and the animal kingdom and the insect kingdom, that everything, the stars, the sun, the grains of sand on the beach, everything is divine. So let us rest in that expansiveness as we sing together, I am remembering who I am. I am remembering who I am. And resting in the fullness of this emptiness, of this silence. We again expand our awareness to remember the I am presence in all beings and drawing that awareness into our heart to remember who we are. And in that spaciousness and fullness, I invite you to breathe in deeply and then exhale, opening your eyes in love and service to what is, as it is, and so it is. If you believe within your heart, you'll know that no one can change the path that you must go. Believe what you Time will come around when you say it's yours. Believe there's a reason to be. Believe you can make time stand still. You know.
stand still. You know from the moment you try, if you believe, I know you will believe in yourself right from the start. Believe Speaking of music, from the sublime to the ridiculous, um, <laughs> one of my birthday presents this year, I just had my 60th birthday, and for one of my birthday presents, my many members of my family came, and um, they came to church that Sunday, and I talked them into singing in the choir with us. And we have a lovely choir, a really wonderful choir, and they were singing this really great repertoire, um, uh, choose something like a star, and then this other piece by Randy Newman called You've Got a Friend in Me. And um, it was a bit like herding cats. They all said they would do it, but that it was a bit like herding cats to get them to actually learn the music, you know? And when we got here, one of my niece had decided she uh, <laughs> hadn't wanted to practice, so, you know, she was practicing frantically in the kitchen the night, the night before the rehearsal. And, and my sister, my oldest sister, Judy, who's, who's not a professional musician, most of us in our family have been professional musicians at one time or another, um, but my oldest sister, Judy, sings with the LGBTQ choir in, um, or chorus in Detroit. And uh, it's called Out and Allies. And um, she uh, did not look at her music at all. And she's, the, one, <laughs> she's the, the least likely one to be able to pick it up quickly. So my nephew, Andrew, uh, Andrew and I tried to talk her into it. We're like, you know, we can, we can help you. We can teach it to you. And Andrew said, I'll just sit next to you and I'll sing the notes in your ear the whole time. But <laughs> she, she wasn't having it. And finally she said, I think she was getting tired of us, she said, well, why don't you just get the choir director to get the, the chorus to sing something that I know? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, what do you know? And she said, it's Raining Men, I Will Survive, and Dancing Queen by ABBA. <laughs> <laughs> Evidently, the gay men's chorus did a disco medley for their, la ooh, for their last concert. Woo, poppy mic. Okay, so, um, <laughs> you know, she said that to me, and, and some things you just cannot unhear or unsee, you know? <laughs> Just thinking of the choir, it's raining men, hallelujah, it's raining. Here's Mary conducting, you know. <laughs> it's something to think about, you know, who knows, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you know, as, as that, the, the tunes, the choir tunes sung by the choir were running through my head, or the disco tunes sung by the choir were running through my head, I, I started thinking of what she said as, as a metaphor for life. That so often we have a song that we know. We have a song or a story that we sing over and over again. We know the lyrics by heart because we've said it so many times. We know the tune by heart because we have rehearsed it into infinity. And we will sing that song or we will sing that story to anybody who will listen. And what we want is for the outside to change. We want the choir, the earth, the world to pick new repertoire for us in order to get us to change, us this, change the song that we're singing. But it doesn't work that way. What if, instead of singing the song that we know, we were to surrender to the infinite song that knows us? What if we could open our hearts 
to be all that spirit calls us to be because spirit believes in us, as Becca said in her song. What if we could move into this place of greater grace and understanding of who we really are and what we came here to do? And I think that the way to do that is through singing a new song. And the way to get to a new song is through the perfection of prayer. That's what this talk is about today, the perfection of prayer. And it's not about praying perfectly in terms of a worldly sense of what perfect is. It's not doing all five steps in the right order, right, practitioners? <laughs> Except for the practitioner students, you still have to do all five steps in the right order, okay? <laughs> Some of my best prayers have been, help me God, or thank you God. That's it, right? It's about praying in the spirit of perfection. And I'll speak about what that means in just a minute. First, I want to give you some definitions. What is prayer? Prayer is belief. Thought plus emotion equals belief. And belief, what we believe is our prayer, and our belief affects the way that we see reality. Belief, an accumulation of belief, the sum total of our beliefs, affects our perspective or our perception. And so if we are believing that life is kind, then wherever we look, we see kindness. If we are believing that life is unkind, then wherever we look, we see things that are against us. Perfection means inclusive of everything. So the prayer of perfection is the prayer of recognizing wholeness. Recognizing that in every appearance of evil, there is a good, and in every appearance of good, there is the capacity for evil, or it wouldn't be good. The two fit together in a beautiful way, and they are held by something greater than the sum of the parts. That's the prayer of perfection. Ernest Holmes, the founder of this denomination, said that the prayer of wholeness, the consciousness of wholeness, is the consciousness of healing. And that there is nothing to be revealed, only wholeness or truth to be revealed. So through our prayer, through our belief, because every belief is a prayer, through our belief, we do the labor, the conscious labor of revealing wholeness, revealing perfection, which is inclusion in all things. And let me be a little bit more specific about what that means. I find the word wholeness to be interesting because wholeness, W-H-O-L-E-N-E-S-S, -S, right? <laughs> wholeness is a beautiful word. It means inclusion. It means integrity, actually. But within that wholeness, if you take out the W, there is a whole, right? There is a wholeness. So within wholeness, there is a whole. Wholeness is everything and perhaps nothing at the same time. Nisargadatta Maharaj, an Indian sage, said that love, wisdom tells me I am nothing. Love tells me I am everything. And my life flows between those two. Wisdom tells me I am nothing. Love tells me I am everything and my life flows between those two. I've been looking at the concept of zero with my mystical foundations class because it keeps coming up in terms of absolute reality. Probably a lot of us learn that zero means nothing. We probably learned that in, in elementary school or before. Zero is nothing. But it's also a circle, which means that it is a symbol of infinite, something that never ends, that has no ending and no beginning. And the truth about zero is that zero is the sum of every single number, positive and negative number. So zero is simultaneously everything and nothing. Are there any elementary school teachers here? There's one there, there's one there. Do you teach? Oh, there's one there, hello. <laughs> Do you teach that in elementary school? Good. Somewhere, yeah, okay. <laughs> Maybe now you will. <laughs> yeah. So zero is the sum of everything and nothing. And it's both at once. And that's the nature of reality. 
It's kind of like how a glass is half full and half empty at the same time, right? You look at a glass and you decide if it's half full or it's half empty. I've got some glasses for you that I want to show you. I love it when I have props. It's so much more fun for me. I hope it's good for you. These glasses are simultaneously half full and half empty. One has delicious iced tea from Trader Joe's, the te, te java, te java, however you say that, right? Delicious, I love that. This one has Metamucil. Look. <laughs> A little scared. <laughs> Look, it's magic. <laughs> it's been in there for a while, so <laughs> this morning. <laughs> So depending on your relationship with what's in the glass, you will call it half full or half empty. If you had to drink this, you might say, oh, I have a whole half a glass. It's full, full of Metam half full of Metamucil, disgusting, right? But if you had this, you'd be like, it's not enough. It's half empty, right? And that's our approach to life. And as a special treat for all of you, I'd like to give these two glasses away. <laughs> so first of all, is anybody a little backed up? Do you, uh, <laughs> Doreen, <laughs> OK. <laughs> anybody want some iced tea? I'm going to give it to Doreen. And uh, Joe, maybe put this on the hospitality table if you don't need it, OK? <laughs> so that's how, that's how life is. Life is constantly this relationship between zero and infinity. You know? And we can, we can witness that in nature. I, I think I shared with you a couple of weeks ago when I was last up in Marin, I was with an astrophysicist. He was one of the people that was attending this seminar that, that we were attending, and he had his telescope, this big, big old telescope, and he brought it out, and he pointed it at a spot in the sky, and he said, let's look at Saturn. And so I looked in, and there was Saturn. There was little Saturn with its little rings and everything, and it was just shining there so innocently. It didn't care whether or not I was looking at it. It just shines its, its light so humbly and so beautifully. And that felt like, like everything to me in that moment once I saw it. But prior to that moment, it had been nothing. I, I didn't even think about Saturn. I didn't know where it was in the sky. And then I came home, and I was hiking in the mountains of Ojai, and I saw this beautiful, beautiful spider web. And it was, it was rings. It was like Saturn. There were rings and, and lines, and there was dew on it. And the dew had these little holographic images of the, the, the surroundings. And, and I was thinking, wow, that's like, that's everything. That's everything. And perhaps it's, it's, it's nothing to the spider who just automatically produces it out of herself. But then if a fly gets caught in it, it's everything to that fly because it means that fly's death. So is a spider web a good thing or a bad thing? Is it nothing or is it everything? It, it's, it's all of it. It's wholeness. It just, just depends on your perspective. And then I think about some of the things that are happening at the church, particularly in the area of the gardens. Um, you know, Norm and uh, Janelle and Lita and Brock have been working on the gardens, and, and others too. Diane has also done some work on it, and, and other, other volunteers. Um, and Norm sends me pictures, one or two pictures, every hour <laughs> about, <laughs> about stuff that's happening in the garden. And I welcome the pictures, because a lot of Norm's pictures are on the, on the PowerPoint slides that we do, or on the website, and they're, they're beautiful. And the, the latest development is that a butterfly hatched in the ramp garden. Beautiful. And there's this chrysalis that is, that is empty, but it was, it was one time fullness. And the butterfly has, has, has risen up out of it. But when the caterpillar created that chrysalis, was that darkness or light? Was that good or bad? It may have been bad for the caterpillar, but it was good for the butterfly. And what if it's all one? What if it's all good and bad? What if it's all darkness and light? What if it's all emptiness and fullness? And the most important thing, how can we practice this to help us live the full, empty, beautiful, filled with grace, filled with wholeness lives that we deserve? How can we practice this? In terms of what I said earlier at the start of this talk about singing your song, you know, singing these repetitive songs, these, t these stories that we tell ourselves, and so often our stories are about personal inadequacy, about how we've messed up, how we've failed, how we're not enough, all of those things. And we make those stories everything. And those stories are everything as long as we tell them that they are everything. But as soon as we shift our perspective and say, maybe this story is nothing in the big scheme of things, the, the butterfly doesn't know anything about our story. The butterfly doesn't know anything about the Supreme Court. 
The butterfly doesn't know if we are everything or nothing. The butterfly just knows that we are. Maybe we could be more like that and say, this story that I am naming everything is in truth nothing. Nothing. And so I let it go. And I allow a greater story, a more truthful story to emerge and fill my heart and move me into action. And that's another application of everything and nothing. You know, in this spiritual center, a lot of our work is around doing small, tiny acts of kindness and understanding that those acts of kindness make a difference, that they ripple out. And we're always looking for evidence that they're rippling out just to reaffirm that for ourselves. And I've found so many, so many stories. I've got tons of stories about acts of kindness that affect somebody that we don't even know and that will affect people seven generations from now. This church will have an impact seven or 12 or 20 generations from now. But our tendency, our story about that is to say that those tiny acts of kindness are nothing. And what if that's not true? What if those tiny acts of kindness are really everything? And what if when you are getting ready to do an act of kindness or you are enacting an act of kindness, what if you were to say to yourself, this means everything. This is powerful. Because it is and it isn't at the same time. So choose the one. Choose the one that you want to hold in your heart. Choose the one that you want to believe and pray the prayer of perfection, of inclusion, of everything. You see how that works? You see how that works? How we're constantly choosing between nothing and everything and we're often putting nothing on the thing that is really everything and we're putting everything on the thing that is really nothing or that we could label, that we could label nothing. If you take this, this message, this idea, into your heart and look at the songs that you are singing and the stories that you are telling and choose wisely, then life becomes a symphony. It becomes beautiful. It becomes a full-on expression of grace. So it's one thing for the really intimate, infinite issues, the songs that we sing about our own lives, but what about a more global perspective? What about some of the problems that we have in the world? I want to tell you that I am completely unqualified to talk about politics. If I, if I wanted to talk about politics, I would need to research both sides of every issue, and that would be too much for me, so I, I don't. I also want to tell you that I, um, I'm going to be talking about some of the, the uh, sexual assault things that have been coming up this week. And I'm probably going to talk at, mostly in terms of men assaulting women, but I also realize that it goes both ways, that women sometimes assault men. And I know that there are many, many good men here, so let's just get that out of the way. I'm not pointing fingers at, at men in particular. It's just what's been up in the news lately. And it seems like there was another warning that I had to give you, but I can't remember what it was. <laughs> Yeah, really, all that I'm qualified to do is to give you what I think is the science of mind perspective on what is happening and to give it through my own personal lens, which is, is I hope, I strive for it to be a lens of wholeness and a lens of introspection and a lens of recognizing my own struggles and my own limitations. So I've been noticing the stories that I've been telling about what's going on with the Supreme Court, with Bill Cosby, with other things that have been brought up to the light. And that's what I really believe, is that these things are being brought up to the light so that they can be healed. But one of my stories is, well, men can't change. And I base that story on the fact, that the most, one of the most extreme examples in my life was when I worked at Bellevue in New York, Bellevue uh, Psychiatric Hospital, and I worked in the prison unit. And I worked with um, convicted rapists and murderers primarily. And you know how on TV they often show, like, uh, we may, if you've never worked in a psychiatric hospital, you may not know this, but they often show psychiatric hospital scenes as, as just horrible. And it's, it's not. It's never that bad. Except Bellevue was pretty bad. <laughs> it, was, it was pretty wild, particularly in that, in that unit. And, and there was, in, in that particular unit, they were awaiting trial or they were waiting to be convicted or some, something like that. I don't quite remember. But there was no rehabilitation going on. The guards were as scary as the, as the prisoners. You know, they would come up to me and say, I, I was like, you know, a sweet young blonde thing in my 20s, and they'd come up to me and they'd say, well, I got a break coming. You want to go with me and get high? 
and they'd be like, you know, you want to you want to befriend the guard. So I'd be like, oh, th I'm trying to cut back, thanks, because <laughs> <laughs> you need them sometimes, you know. And 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 I just saw no hope of rehabilitation there. And that's what I'm basing this this song that I've been singing for years that men can't change. And you would think you would think that I would know better, you know, because every every time I teach Prac two, I do this this story from a psychologist or psychiatrist called Erwin Yalom who is working with a guy that is completely, a complete, let me say the word, a complete pervert in terms of women. He is, he is despicable, he is horrible, and Yalom turns him around in a very beautiful way so that he is actually helping women. I spoke with somebody the other night who does a spiritual technique of talking and listening in prisons where people change, and he also does it in schools where bullies stop bullying. So maybe for me, I'm making this idea that men can't change into everything when really I could call it nothing. It only has the power that I give it. And can we collectively decide that men, women, anybody who is a, a sexual assailant, that they have the capacity to change? Unless they don't. Sometimes they don't. And then they have to experience consequences. Another story that I've been telling myself, another song, and I'm struggling with this. I'm not sure that I'm ready to talk about this because I'm not sure that I have the right words. But this, it's this idea of, okay, women really want men to change. Women in these positions want men to be different. And if we wait for men to change, we may have to wait a really long time and people may get hurt in the waiting. And so what can women do? What can women do differently? And I know, I know that it's, it's you know, I, I often get accused of, of uh, blaming the victim in this, you know, uh, shaming people for having been sexually assaulted, and, I, and that's not it at all. I, I just read this beautiful article about what to say to, to people that have been sexually assaulted, and I'll put it in the newsletter. It was beautiful. It was written by a friend of mine. It's not that at all, and, and I've had, you know, probably every woman here has had unwanted sexual advances, and I actually was probably about three seconds from being raped one time in the subway. And it was a... It was, uh, I think, an act of God that, it, that the person didn't go through with it. And the thing that I did wrong, <laughs> wrong, was that I was reading a book and I was engrossed in the book and I didn't recognize that the subway had cleared and I was alone in the car with a sexual predator between stops. And it was very obvious that he was a sexual predator. He made that very clear to me. And just through the grace of God, I think, Part of it was that I was wearing pants and I was hard to get to. And, and the, the subway did not stop between stops as it sometimes does. It went on and it stopped and I got out off the train and was, and was safe. But I look back on that and, you know, you think about people shaming victims and saying, well, you know, you shouldn't, you shouldn't be alone in a subway car. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I, I did make a change based on that. I, I looked up every time I turned a page. It's to, to see if the car was emptying out so I wouldn't be alone on a subway car ever again. But I didn't start wearing pants on the subway all the time. I felt like it was okay to wear a skirt on the subway, you know? So it's, it's not that. It's something else. It's recognizing, I think for, for us personally, if we are in a, pl in a place when we are not particularly traumatized, because I was not overly traumatized by that. It was scary and I broke into a cold sweat and I'm really, really, really glad it didn't happen. But if if we are in a place of strength and ability to move on and do something else, it's to ask ourselves the hard questions of how have I contributed to a society? We are all responsible. How have I contributed to a society where there is so much of this stuff going on? You know, and I'm not proud of this, but there have been times when I have done things with men that I haven't really wanted to do for various reasons, that he would be mad if I didn't, or I wanted him to love me, right? I would ask for a show of hands so I don't feel so alone up here, but, but I'm not going to do that. You know, and, and so it's, it's looking at that and, and having a different, a stronger message and being able to tell our daughters and our young people that they don't have to do what they don't want to do. And if I'm really honest and I look at where s the sources of sexual assault come from, I think it probably has to do with fear and ignorance. And so have I contributed to the fear and ignorance of men in any way? Have I treated men in a demeaning fashion? <sighs> I, yes, I have. It seems like 
those stories that I'm telling myself in my own mind, you know, it's like these are just little things, these are nothing, these can't make a difference, but what again if they are everything? What if we collectively all change our minds to relate to others in a, in a, in a in completely respectful fashion and relate to ourselves in a completely respectful fashion? And that's the other thing I want to say about what's happening in the news, is that I think it is summon, summoning us, those of us that are aware and awake, to build a culture of respect. Because that to me seems to be, that's the word that keeps coming up for me when I say, what is the missing ingredient? It's to build a culture of respect. And again, our, our minds, our dualistic minds will say, well, that's not enough. But I think a culture of respect is everything. Making an effort to go out of our way to be respectful to others. Making an effort to be respectful to ourselves and not doing what we don't want to do in order to please someone or in order to make them not be mad at us or in order to get them to love us. That is a culture of respect. Oh, and it can show up in so many beautiful, blissful, tiny ways, tiny ways, and just the part of the work of building this culture of respect is noticing it, noticing it and seeing it when it shows up and seeing how it shows up. Here's a ridiculous story. My husband and I uh, were at home, and I'm often, he's, he's away this week, so I'm, I'm talking about him. <laughs> but, uh, but I'm often writing, and he comes up to me, and he wants to tell me something in the backyard, something, something that's going on in the backyard. And I'm like looking for the perfect word. You know, I'm writing a, a, a message or a blog or something, and I'm, I'm like seeking that perfect word, and he's like, Bon, guess what? <laughs> The other day he came up to me with a bond, guess what, when I was writing it, he said, one of our goldfish will swim into my hand. He'll swim into my hand, important news, right? Very worthy of, of interrupting me. He'll swim into my hand and then I throw him into the fountain. We have this little fountain. And then I put my hand back in and he swims back for more. <laughs> and I, I went out and watched it and I may have been a bit dismissive, I may have been a bit disrespectful. You know, it's like, I'm writing a sermon and you want to tell me about throwing the fish in the backyard, <laughs> really? But the next day I had a second thought about it and, my, and Hugh was in the, in the uh, garden and he was working and, and I went up to him and I said, you know, Hugh, I'd like to take a crack at throwing that fish with you. <laughs> so we did and it was magical. It was magical. Put your hand in, the fish swims in. There's actually two that do it. Sw fish swims into your hand and you throw it, just a light toss. And then it comes back for more. It's like, it's like, um, Six Flags Magic Mountain for the, for the fish, I think. <laughs> and again, you know, I think, wow, that's like such a moment of, of it's just, it's ridiculous throwing your fish in the backyard. But, but look at it. <laughs> no, who does that, you know? Is that going to save the world? But when I look deeper, when I look deeper, I see it as, it as a moment of joy and intimacy and respect for each other and respect for this beloved little animal that is probably meaningless to 99% of the world. And, and it's just, it's, it's what the world of grace and the culture of respect is built upon. Now, you all don't have to get a fish and start throwing it around, okay? <laughs> Yes, you do? Oh, okay. Well, we'll give you the, the kind, okay? It's a special kind, I think, that likes to be thrown. <laughs> but <laughs> there's always one. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not about th throwing the fish. It's about finding, again, what makes you come alive and what makes you deepen in respect for yourself and for one another and doing that with passion and refusing to minimize it refusing to call it nothing, because it is nothing, but it is also simultaneously everything, and recognizing in that moment, changing your perspective to see that these small acts of respect and grace are everything, because that is what changes the world and makes it a better place for all beings. We do this work for all beings. In this center, I often quote my friend Pancho, who was arrested during an Occupy uh, event up in Oakland. He was arrested for meditating in public. <laughs> Disturbing the peace, it was called. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> 
And it was beautiful because he went into the prison and he, he, he made people cry, people uh, like the, the prison guards cry with his beauty. And he asked for uh, cleaning supplies so that he could clean up the cell for the next person. And he left a note saying, this cell has been cleaned for you. Will you please pay it forward? Little acts that don't seem to matter. But one of the things that Pancho says is that the 99% has to embrace the 100%. And I would add to that that the 1% has to embrace the 100%. No, the 1% has to embrace the 100%. We're all about embracing the 100%. This is the work of wholeness. This is the work of joy. This is the work of grace. This is the work that we are called here to do. If you are here, you are here by divine appointment. Even you, Becca, we're paying you to be here. You were paying you guys to be here, but you are here by divine appointment to do this work of grace and to help all of us create that culture of respect where our young children can grow up Help all of us grow the youth and family program and we can teach them this at an early age so that they are not in an awkward position someday wondering, is it okay to say no? Helping all of us to expand and be that wholeness that we long to seek in the world. Being all of that and so much more. One of the ways I'm going to invite you to do that since I'm not instructing each of you to get a fish to throw it around, except for Jennifer, is to, in the bookstore on our priceless pricing table, we have this little book called The Golden Key. And I know that many of you have read it. And the book is, yeah, the book is kind of dated. It's, it's a not to gender inclusive language. It refers to God as he, which is, we, don't, we sort of avoid that here. But it doesn't really matter. You know, we can look past that. We know that God's not a guy in the sky, right? We all know that. Stand up if you do not know that, and we will, <laughs> we will lovingly correct you. <laughs> but what the, the basic premise of the golden key is that this stuff, these principles that I'm speaking about, or any spiritual principle that is whole and sound and worthy, actually needs to be practiced. You can't just do it and then say, oh, that's a lovely idea. You actually have to do it. It's like in order to swim, you can't just read a book about swimming. You have to get into the water and move your arms, and then you're swimming, right? The, the practice of the golden key is to notice whenever you are worrying, to notice whenever you are complaining, to notice whenever you are focusing on less than or inadequacy, and then think about God instead. Think about love instead. Think about wholeness instead. And what he recommends, Emmett Fox recommends, just if you don't have anything to say, just say some of the things that you've learned here in church. Just keep reciting affirmations or, or holy poems or scripture or whatever it is. God is love. I am love. This is love. This is wholeness working itself out. This is like a, a caterpillar turned to mush in a chrysalis that will eventually rise up as a butterfly. Every time we are tempted to complain or worry or any of the other repertoire that we tend to sing frequently, think about God instead and speak of it and live it. Live like the truth is true. That, my friends, I think, I know. Let's get away with this I think business, right? That, my friends, can change the world, and we get to be part of it. So let's do that now, and let us pray. And so I turn within and absolutely trust to know that there is one perfect life, that life is wholeness, that life is God's life, that life is our life right now. That life has brought us here together by divine appointment through sheer grace to celebrate these words and this music and this fellowship together, to evolve in community and to be that community that creates a culture of respect. Starting here, starting with ourselves, starting with with the members of this community and beyond and rippling out into the world so that respect touches every life. And so I claim respect right here and right now. I claim the awareness of wholeness for each of us right here and right now. I celebrate the fact that everything is nothing and everything is something and everything is everything and it just depends on our perspective. I celebrate the knowing of that and look forward to ways that we can apply it in creative and wonderful and beautiful ways that uplift our lives and send us forth into the world with a shield, a holy shield of light and love. I am so grateful 
So grateful for this openness, so grateful for this beautiful, powerful spiritual center, so grateful for what we teach, so grateful for the living presence of spirit living and moving and having its perfect being through each of us. I bless this teaching as I bless all paths to God, churches, synagogues, temples, mosques, ashrams. I bless fundamentalists, I bless atheists, I bless our country. And with a heart that is so filled with blessedness and so filled with love and so filled with the transformative power of goodness. I say thank you, Spirit, thank you, God, and I release these words into the perfection of the mystical law, and together we say, and so it is. I am so blessed, I am so blessed. dream. 